In the last section, we described what an orbital was, and we showed that an orbital is the space where we can say that there's a high probability of finding an electron. So um, remember, these orbitals have different shapes depending on the energy level of that electron. So um, depending on how many electrons there are around the atom, which we can find by looking that atom up on a periodic table, uh, the electrons around that atom are in different orbitals that have different shapes. So um, one way that we can keep track of which electrons are in which orbitals for every element is with um, a representation that we call the electron configuration. So the uh, electron configuration is a description of the orbitals occupied by electrons. So if we know which atom we're talking about and how many electrons it has, if we know which element it is, then we can write the electron configuration of that atom, uh, which just tells us how many electrons there are and what orbitals those electrons are in. So uh, for hydrogen, the first element on the periodic table, hydrogen only has one electron. So this superscript here tells us how many electrons are in this orbital. There's one electron, and that one electron is in a 1s orbital. So remember, um, just to uh, kind of refresh your memory about what um, orbitals are. Remember, orbitals have different shapes. S orbitals are kind of like spheres. P orbitals are kind of like dumbbell or two balloons, right? And D orbitals are kind of like four balloons. And F orbitals are eight balloons. I can't even draw that. So remember the the different letters represent different shapes of orbitals. Um, and the different numbers in front of the orbital represents what energy level it is. So remember if we're talking about um, the nucleus, then we have energy level one energy level 2, energy level 3, energy level 4. So we're just talking about what shell, like an onion, which shell the electrons are in. Those are the energy levels. So in shell 1, we would find the 1s orbital. It's the only orbital in that shell. In shell 2, we'll find the 2s and the 2p orbital. In shell 3, we'll find a 3s, a 3p, and a 3d. In orbital four, in energy level four, we'll find a 4s, 4p, 4d, and a 4f, and so on. So the we can using an electron configuration, we can name the orbital, and we can tell how many electrons are in that orbital. Uh, two electrons fit in every orbital. So it doesn't matter what kind of orbital it is. It doesn't matter if it's an S or a P or a D or an F. Even in an F orbital, which has eight of these balloons, even in an F orbital, there's only two electrons that can fit in one. So a 4F orbital, two electrons can fit um, in each of those uh, sublevels. So um, remember that uh, within each of these different types of orbitals, Sometimes we have different orientations of the orbitals, so we'll get there in a minute. Um, so two electrons can fit in every sublevel of 4f, I should say. But since there are seven sublevels of 4f, then that means there are 14 electrons that can fit in those seven, seven sublevels. Um, so let's look at another electron configuration here. Um, the reason that two electrons can fit in each orbital is because electrons have a property called electron spin. And electrons can bin, be either spin up or spin down, which is kind of like saying that, like in a magnet, magnets have a north pole and a south pole. So that's kind of the same, the same, the similar property that electrons have. They can be spin up, kind of like north, and spin down, kind of like south. So um, the uh, way that this was discovered was that a beam of silver atoms was passed through um, a magnet 
and the magnets split the silver atoms into two, uh, into two separate spots. And so silver atoms, which were thought to be one just pure material, so there would only, should only be one type of atom in there, well, it turns out that there were two types of atoms. So depending on whether they were spin up or spin down, the electrons were interacting with the magnet in a different way. So the electrons in those silver atoms were causing the atoms to actually spread out due to the effect of the magnetic field. So we can say that the um, electrons are spin up or spin down. And what that, oops, what that means in terms of the um, spin quantum number, ms, is that those values can be plus one half or minus one half. So just to remind you about the quantum numbers, we have the quantum number n, which is the principal quantum number, which tells us the electron shell or what energy level the electron is in, whether it's in one or two or three or four, remember they have integer values. We have the quantum, uh, quantum number L, which is the angular momentum quantum number. Um, and this can have values of zero or one or two or three. And this tells us whether the orbital is an s orbital, a p orbital, or a d orbital. Um, we can have the magnetic quantum number, which is m sub l, and the magnetic quantum number tells us the orientation of the orbital. So for example, with p orbitals, whether they're aligned on the y axis, the x axis, or the z axis. So we have three values for m sub l of, with p orbitals, those three orientations. And now, we'll introduce the spin quantum number m sub s. So there are four quantum numbers all together in order for us to uniquely describe the position of every electron in an atom. If we, in an atom, so for example, let's say um, an atom of uh, oxygen, which has um, eight protons and eight neutrons and eight electrons, so in an oxygen in an atom of oxygen with eight electrons if each of those electrons has four uh, quantum numbers that describes that electron so i should have eight sets of these quantum numbers in an atom of oxygen six seven eight I would have to know what is the value of n, what is the value of l, what is the value of m sub l, and what is the value of m sub s for the first electron in oxygen. And then those values for the second electron in oxygen, and so on. And um, each electron has a unique uh, set of these quantum numbers. So if I have four quantum numbers, then I can describe a, the unique position of each of these electrons, of every electron in an atom. So the um, values of m sub s, the spin quantum number, those values can be plus one half or minus one half. There's only two possibilities. So with all of the other quantum numbers, we can have more than two possibilities. But with m sub s, it's only plus one half or minus one half. And those two possibilities are plus one half, we're saying spin up. That's like the, the um, electron having a north magnetic pole. And minus one half is spin down. That's like the electron having a south magnetic pole. So um, orbital diagrams use a square to represent the orbital, or sometimes a line. And half of an arrow represents whether the electron is spin up or spin down. So the reason that two electrons can fit inside of an orbital is because two plus, or excuse me, two up electrons will not fit in an orbital, and two down electrons will not fit in an orbital. In an orbital, there's only room for one up electron and one down electron. So every orbital holds two electrons, and those electrons must be spin paired, one up, one down. That's why we put two electrons in each orbital. So here is the set of quantum numbers for the two electrons in helium. Helium is the second element. It has two electrons. The two electrons that helium has are both in the first shell. So remember, the first shell of electrons can hold two electrons. So 
the, first, the two electrons that are in helium are both in the first shell. So n equals 1 for both of those electrons. The electrons are in an orbital called 1s. So in an s orbital, l equals 0. Remember when we're talking about s orbitals, l equals 0. Um, and the rules here, remember the rules are for l, l equals n minus 1. m sub l equals minus l to positive l and m sub s is always plus one half or minus one half. Okay, so if we know what the principal quantum number is, 1, then we know what the values of L will be. So 1 minus 1, L equals 0. And when L equals 0, we're talking about a s, an s orbital. If we know what the value of, uh, value of L is, 0 in this case, then m sub L is minus L to plus L, which L is 0. So minus 0 to plus 0 is just 0. And ms can have two values. It can have plus 1 half or minus 1 half. So one of the electrons that's in this 1s orbital in helium is plus 1 half. And one of the electrons, the other electron that's in this 1s orbital in helium is minus 1 half. So these are the quantum numbers that describe, that uniquely describe the two electrons that are in helium. So um, s orbitals only have one, there's only one orbital for each s orbital. Um, but when we're talking, that's because m sub l equals zero. And remember, m sub l tells us the number of orbitals of sublevels that are within that, uh, that um, principal energy level. So when we're talking about uh, a, an or a p orbital, for example, p orbitals have three different sublevels have three different um, orientations of the p orbital. So when we look at the values of m sub l for a p orbital, when l equals 1, then the values of m sub l can be minus 1, 0, and plus 1. So those three values of m sub l indicate three different orbitals that are three different subsections of a p orbital, three different parts of, of p orbital, or three different types of p orbitals. Whenever we have more than one orbital, so like p orbitals have three, d orbitals have five, oops, we call those um, orbitals that are the same, with the same energy, we call them degenerate. So whenever orbitals have the same energy, they're called degenerate orbitals. Uh, when we're talking about the electrons on an atom that has lots of electrons, a multi-electron atom, then um, the electrons that are closest to the nucleus feel the positive charge of the nucleus the most, and electrons that are far away in shell 7, for example, feel the positive charge of the nucleus less. So electrons in shell 1 feel a strong attraction to the nucleus, but electrons in shell 7 feel a weaker attraction to the nucleus. Part of the reason is that they're further away in shell 7, and part of the reason is because in shell 7, there are electrons that are in shell 6, and electrons in shell 6 are negative, negatively charged. So the electrons in shell 7 are right next to electrons in shell 6 that are negatively charged, that are somewhat re repelling the electrons in shell 7. So sh shells 6 and 7 repel each other because they're both full of electrons, and electrons are both negatively charged and they repel. So even though shell 6 is attracted to the nucleus and shell 7 is attracted to the nucleus, shell 6 and 7 are repelled by each other. So that limits, the, um, that limits the attraction that those electrons in the outer shell feel for the nucleus. So we call that, um, since it's, it's lower, we call that the effective nuclear charge of the electron. The electron feels a lower nuclear charge. So whatever it is, we call it the effective nuclear charge. It's less than the actual nuclear charge. So um, because of this, this shielding, 
we say that the electrons on the outside are shielded from the nucleus by the electrons on the inside. Those in shell 7 are shielded by the electrons in shell 6. So the closer an electron is to the nucleus, the more attraction it experiences. So the better an electron is at penetrating through the electron cloud, the more attraction it will have for the nucleus. So what that means is that some shapes of orbitals are closer to the, get electrons closer to the nucleus than other shapes. The s orbital gets electrons really close to the nucleus because it's kind of a sphere that concentrates the electrons at, by the nucleus. P orbitals get, can't get the electron quite as close. So um, remember an s orbital, here's the nucleus, an s orbital is just a sphere around the nucleus. Here's the nucleus. A p orbital kind of goes above the nucleus and below the nucleus. So you can already see there's a lot less space in a p orbital. There's a lot less opportunity for an electron to get close to the nucleus. Here, there's all of this room for an electron in this orbital, because remember, the electron could possibly be anywhere in this orbital. So it can occupy all of this space right next to the nucleus. But in a p orbital, an electron can't get very that close to the nucleus because it only can get inside this little tiny point that comes to the nucleus and all of this space on either side is empty right there's nothing over here there's nothing over here so an s orbital has better is, is better at penetrating the all of the other electrons than a p orbital is and it, and p orbitals are better than d orbitals this is s P and D orbitals here. Pardon my drawing skills. And then F orbital that I can't even draw. Eight. Eight balloons. So the S orbital has the highest penetration, which is higher than P, which is higher than D, and F has the lowest. So um, the the closest that an electron the closer an electron can get to the nucleus. The lower, its elect, the lower its energy is, and the more attraction it will feel to the nucleus. So S's have the highest penetration, and F's have the lowest penetration. So, yeah, so this thing is skipping around a lot today. So um, here is an uh, atom with a 3 plus charge in the nucleus, that means it must be lithium. Remember, we can tell what, uh, what atom it is by counting the protons. And if this one has 3 protons, then it's the third element, which is lithium. So these, uh, if it has 3 protons, it also has 3 electrons. Those 3 electrons are in orbitals, and 2 electrons can fit in the first orbital. So this blue part here represents the first orbital, and the first orbital is an s orbital. In fact, it's a 1s orbital. So these two electrons are inside the 1s orbital, and the 1s orbital is this blue part. This electron right here, the third electron, it is not in the 1s orbital because it can't fit. The third electron is actually part of the 2s orbital. So the 2s orbital is out here. It's a little bit bigger than the 1s. Here's 1s. Here's 2s. So the 2s electron is not as close to the nucleus as the 1s electron is. And if we keep track of the charges of these electrons here, is, yeah, this guy's negative, 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 right? So this negative one right here and this negative one right here, they're repelling each other. They're pushing. They're pushing on each other. So this electron it is attracted to the positive charge, negative, plus, minus, plus, but minus, minus, it's repelled from this electron underneath. This is a, re a repelling force, even though this is an attractive force. So the electrons on the inside are held really tight to the nucleus, and the electrons on the outside are held less tight because they're being repelled a little bit and because they're further away, so they're being held less tight than the ones on the inside. Uh, if an electron, because of the uh, shape of the nucleus, so 
excuse me, the shape of the orbital. So a 1s orbital, I'm going to draw the orbitals in a different color now. The 1s orbital is blue. It kind of ends right here. It kind of ends right there at the edge. The 2s orbital is red. It's a little bit bigger. It has a, a larger radius. Here's the 2s orbital. And the 2s orbital encompasses the 1s orbital. So what I'm saying is the 2s orbital is not a donut. It doesn't look like this with the 1s orbital on the inside only. The 2s orbital is a full sphere. So the electron could also be near the nucleus. Even in the 2s orbital, the electron can get near the nucleus. So the 2s orbital, because the, the 2s orbital has electron density a little bit near the nucleus too, then this electron, even though sometimes it's out here, sometimes it's out here beyond the uh, edge of the 1s orbital, sometimes the electron in the 2s orbital can get inside the next to the nucleus because the 2s orbital penetrates the 1s orbital a little bit. It can get in there too. So in a, if I were to put a 2p orbital on here, right, the 2p orbital is kind of like this. It kind of goes out a little tiny bit further than the 2s orbital. And the 2p orbital, at least one of them, the electron would be here, and the electron would be here, 2p. So in that case, an electron spends some of its time out here beyond the edge of the 2s, but even the electron in the 2p, some of the time, it can spend right here. The electron, even in the 2p orbital, can get pretty close to the nucleus, right? It's not that far away from the nucleus. And then if we keep going a little bit, make a yellow one here, here's the 3s orbital. 3s orbital goes beyond all of those. It's even further out. The 3s orbital encompasses all of this space too. So sometimes the 3s orbital can get close to the nucleus, but sometimes the 3s electron is way out here. So sometimes it's not very close to the nucleus. And the 3d kind of looks like this. Right, so the 3d electron can spend any of its time in this black part. So you can see the 3d, it's got a lot of space way out here, kind of beyond the edge of everything. And as it gets closer and closer, the space that it has available for that electron to be in gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets close to the nucleus and there's barely any space at all for the electron in a 3d, elect in a 3D orbital to get close. So an s orbital has a lot of penetration. A p orbital has a little bit of penetration. The d orbital is even further away than the p. And f orbitals are even further away than that. So that's the idea with penetration and shielding. We can represent that graphically here. This is the distance from the nucleus. And the uh, space underneath this curve is the likelihood that we would expect um, an electron to be there. So you can see that as this gets further and further, this is further and further away from the nucleus. And when we're at zero, we're really close to the nucleus. So here's a 1s orbital. The 1s orbital shows that there's a lot of space. The space, it keeps on going, right? We could trace this curve. It's going to go up a little bit higher. So. Um, and as it comes down over here, it bottoms out. So what we're saying is that this space right here, it gets all the way down to zero. So we're saying that an electron that's in the 1s orbital, the electron that's here in this space, can get right next to the nucleus, all the way down to zero. It has a high probability of being there. Now if we look at an electron that's in the 2s, here's an electron that's in the 2s, look at this. This is this part of the 2s that goes out beyond ever, that goes out beyond the 1s. 
So if an electron is over here, then it's out beyond the 1s and it's, fielding, it's field feeling shielding. But look, there's this little tiny bit of the curve right here, this little hump right here where it goes down, 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 shielding, 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 penetration. So if the electron can be in a 2s orbital, it does have some probability of being right next to the nucleus. It's just a little hump. This one, the 1s, is a huge hump, has a huge probability of being right next to the nucleus. But the 2s orbital does still have a little probability of being next to the nucleus. If we look at a 2p orbital, the 2p orbital shows that this spot here, beyond, out beyond the 1s orbital, so it's further away from the nucleus than the 1s orbital is. And as we get down closer and closer and closer, a 2p orbital does not have this little hump like the 2s does. That's because a 2s orbital is good at penetrating because of its shape. It, can, it has a lot of space next to the nucleus. And a 2p orbital is, does not have good penetration because it is not, its shape does not let it get close to the nucleus. So this piece right here shows us the penetration of the 2s. The red curve has it. The blue curve for the 2p does not have it. There's nothing here for the, the blue curve for the 2p. It doesn't have a little hump that comes back up. So what that means is that um, when uh, we're looking at an atom that has lots of electrons, then um, the energy of the sublevels within the energy level, those energies are no longer degenerate. Okay, this is what we're talking about when we talk about how penetration and shielding affects the orbital energy levels of degenerate orbitals. So these are the energy levels of hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one electron. So you might ask, why does it have so many levels if it only has one electron? So hydrogen has one electron, and its one electron is down here. Oops, I didn't mean to draw that so many times. It's, let's say it's one electron. It happens to be spin up in this one hydrogen atom here. If we give this one hydrogen electron in a hydrogen atom, if we give it energy, maybe we promote that electron up here to 2s. We give it energy. Energy comes in gets promoted up to 2s. Now that electron's up here in 2s. So what's going to happen to an electron that's excited? Well, it's going to release energy, and it's going to fall back down. Right? Excitation, relaxation. So that we might think that when the electron gets excited, it goes to 2s. But you know what? The electron could get excited. Energy comes in and the electron gets excited, but it goes to 2p. And then excited electrons relax, so what does it do? It releases energy, and it falls back down, and it goes back down to 1s. Or the electron could receive energy. Oops. The electron could receive energy, energy in, and maybe it goes up to 3s, or maybe it goes up to 3p, or maybe it goes up to 3d. So if an electron in a hydrogen atom receives energy, it gets excited. And when it gets excited, it goes from the ground state, the lowest energy orbital, it'll go up to one of these higher orbitals. It'll be excited. And then it loses energy, and it relaxes, and it falls back down. If it, if it gets exactly this amount of energy, let's call this amount of energy here, delta E1, let's call this amount of energy delta E2. So if an electron in 1s, if it's coming in, and it gets delta E1 worth of energy, 
then it has it could go into any of these orbitals it could go here or it could go here or it could go here or it could go here because the distance between 1s and 2s and 2p in all of these orbitals is exactly the same in hydrogen all of the orbitals in the second energy level are degenerate they're all at the same energy if a hydrogen atom were to receive oops, if a hydrogen atom were to receive some energy in and it's delta e1 plus delta e2 so now it has enough energy to go up to this level so it could the electron could go here or 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 here because the distance between 1s and any of the orbitals in the third level is exactly the same in hydrogen the distance between the first level and any of the orbitals in the fourth shell is exactly the same in hydrogen so when I only have one electron there's only one electron down here then all of the orbitals above look exactly the same 2s and 2p are equal 3s and 3p and 3d are equal in energy they all equal each other but only in hydrogen where there's only one electron so let's see what happens when we talk about atoms that have more than one electron in orbitals in atoms that have more than one electron now the orbitals look like this so look what happened here is the first energy level here is the second energy level green third energy level blue fourth energy level purple I don't have purple blue and red didn't make it as purpley as I had hoped all right, so here's what happened. Here's the first, I'm just gonna peek back here for a second. See, in the second energy level, all the orbitals are the same. The third energy level, they're all the same. Fourth energy level, they're all the same. But down here, in the second energy level, 2s is lower than 2p. In the third energy level, 3s is lower than 3p, and 3p is lower than 3d. In the fourth energy level, 4s is lower than 4p. 4p is lower than 4d so something happens when an atom gets more electrons something happens that shifts the energy of these orbitals the orbitals some of the orbitals go up in energy because this these orbitals the 2p orbitals used to be right here 2p 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 this is what it looks like in hydrogen and then when I get more electrons than hydrogen somehow these energies get shifted up and the three P's used to be down here at the same level as 3s and in hydrogen the three D's are down here at the same level as 3s all of them are the same in hydrogen 3p but when I have more electrons than hydrogen all of these energies get shifted up 3d goes all the way up here So when I have multi-electron atoms, which is really any atom that's not hydrogen, only hydrogen has one electron, every other atom has more electrons than that, then the orbital energies are no longer degenerate. Remember, degenerate means they're all at the same energy. Well, in atoms that are not hydrogen, the 2s and 2p orbitals are not degenerate. 3s, 3p, and 3d are not degenerate. But the orbitals within the 2p are all degenerate 2p and 2p and 2p are still exactly the same energy 3p and 3p and 3p they're still exactly the same energy so the orbitals that are within a subshell the p's or the d's or the f's they're still at the same energy they're still all exactly the same so the reason that this happens is because 
in multi electron atoms if I have if I just don't have just one down here I have two down here and maybe I have a couple up here then these electrons right here are negative and these electrons right here are negative and they're repelling each other and when they repel each other that changes the energy of these orbitals so these electrons here in this orbital are now being repelled by the electrons that are in this orbital and the electrons in this orbital are being repelled by the electrons in this orbital and these electrons are being repelled by these electrons right here and these electrons down here as I start adding electrons and filling up these shells all of the electrons that go within subsequent shells like this they all start bumping into each other and these are repelling these and these are repelling these and when that happens it, they sh get shifted so when the 2p electrons and the 2 and the 3p electrons when all those orbitals are full then this one pushes these up because these are electrons and they're negative and so this cloud has an effect on this cloud and it makes those 3p orbitals go up in energy so when there's only one electron in hydrogen when there's only one electron there's nothing this electron is not repelling anything because these are all empty they're empty there's no electrons there but when I fill it up with electrons in any atom that's not hydrogen all of the electrons they start bumping into each other and when they bump into each other all of these energies start to get shifted and so these energies go up and these energies go up and these energies go up and all of the energies get shifted a little bit